Hi, John Harris here, Bible teacher at the Altoona Bible Church, and uh, I'm sharing this uh, message today uh, for my class, my Ambassador Sunday School class, and anybody else that uh, might be interested. Uh, today's message uh, that I'm going to share, the lesson, is on faith over fear. Uh, we're going to be looking at, uh, actually it's a several week uh, message uh, that, I'll, that uh, we'll be doing, but we'll be looking at uh, uh, the aspects of faith and fear. And I think the issues of fear uh, right now are uh, pretty uh, uh, pertinent to what's happening around us in the world, uh, the pandemic and the things that are going on. There's a lot of fear. Uh, and not that some fear is not good. I mean, the scriptures talk about good fear, fear of the Lord and, and seeing God for who he really is. Um, uh, there is also fear that we're supposed to be like to, to flee, you know, lusts and useful lusts and things like that. So we're supposed to run away. Uh, so there's good fear. Now, the type of fear I'm talking about is an unhealthy fear, uh, a type of fear that grips you um, like the deer in the headlights uh, sort of uh, fear that uh, shuts us down and doesn't allow us to, to enjoy actually what God has in store for us, doesn't allow us to experience uh, the good things that God is providing. So I want to talk about that, all right? Uh, so we're going to talk about faith as really the answer to it, uh, and that'll be coming in uh, 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 f uh, future messages. Uh, but right now I want to talk about the fear part, and why it is that we, you know, where, where does this come from, I guess? You know, you know where, where does it all come from? So first, let's look what the scriptures have to say, and uh, we'll uh, ask the Lord to bless this moment uh, that we're together here, and then we will uh, have our study. So let's pray together if you want to join me. So Heavenly Father, we do pray, Lord, that uh, as we take your word, uh, we'll, that we're honest with it, that we let it speak. Uh, Lord, just uh, let your word uh, uh, convict our hearts, let your spirit, Lord, touch us, Lord, with what you want us to know, and and uh, Lord, how we should uh, uh, see the world and how we should live our lives. We thank you, Lord, for all that you're going to do uh, and praise you, Lord, for what you're going to accomplish. In Christ Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, take your Bibles. Turn to 2 Timothy 1, verse 7. So um, there's a, this particular passage here uh, makes the following statement. So take your, take, take your, do please join me. Uh, turn your Bibles to 2 Timothy 1, verse 7. And here's what we read. It says, for God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. You know, what that verse is saying, and now we're going to, by the way, we're going to look at some more of that passage uh, later, uh, but this, just this first part I want you to uh, take note of is that God hath not given us the spirit of fear. Uh, fear, and this type of fear here, this fear that, that grips us and, and, and makes us, immobilizes us, that fear is not given by God. Okay, that comes from somewhere else. And I want to talk about that part today. And then we'll talk about how to, you know, how to get, work through that fear and, and where to go. But notice what God has given us. God not given us the sphere of fear, fear, but God hath given us power, love, and a sound mind. Three other things. Right? God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of, of a sound mind. The spirit of love the spirit of power, and the spirit of a sound mind. God is producing those three things, power, love, and a sound mind. Notice that when you have fear in our life, this, this gripping fear, it actually negates those three things. So when we have fear, we become powerless. Have you ever been in that situation? Where, where it's just sort of like, the, the, it, you just can't do the things that you want to do. It's just like it grips us, it locks us down, it freezes us, like that deer in the headlights sort of thing. Power is the ability to do, all right? In this case, God's work, God's will, okay? But like fear, which it doesn't come from God, it comes from somewhere else, it keeps us from doing things, all right? Fear also basically takes away love. When we are gripped in fear, it's hard to think of someone else, right? You know, you know, love is being other-centered, looking at others, to put others first. When we're in fear, others go out the window. They're not, they're not part of it because we're just preserving ourselves, right? So fear really works against the things that God wants us to do, right, in that, in that case. So fear takes away power, the ability to do. Fear takes away love. It doesn't enable us to care or focus on other people first. Right, and the third thing is fear grips our mind. 
You know, uh, God's given us power, love, and a sound mind as the way to, to think about things properly, to see things in the right perspective. For instance, Colossians 3 says, If, um, uh, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, as Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above. You know, we're supposed to be focused that direction, right? And the reason is because, you know, we're dead and our life is hid with Christ. And when Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall he also appear with him in glory. You know, that God says, focus on what we need to be looking at. But when we're in fear, we can't, our mind becomes corrupt in how we, how we, how we think about things. Fear makes people do strange things. I mean, just look around you in the world right now. I mean, I mean I'm, by the way, I'm not discounting what's happening. I mean, there are... You know, there, these are, these are, you know, there's real stuff happening, right? But, like, how we approach that, if we're approaching it in fear, okay, it's going to be totally different than if you approach it in faith, right? If you have fear, there's no power, there's no love, there's no sound thinking, all right? And it's difficult, and you wonder, you know, it's just, you, you just, you get consumed by it, all right? God doesn't want you to be consumed by this. He wants you to have the power to get through this. And he wants you to love others through this. And he wants you to have clear, level, sound thinking. Your mind is, is uh, uh, seeing things in the proper perspective, right? That's what God desires. That's what actually what God produces in our life, right? So where does this fear come from? Just so you know, God doesn't want you to fear in those types of ways. God wants you to have a different relationship with him. Turn to Romans chapter 8. You know, today, uh, as, uh, as you listen to others talk, um, there's folks talking about God punishing us today, right? That this is a punishment from God. That This is something that God's brought down on man to, to, uh, to punish him. Uh, maybe like an Old Testament type of thing, right? Um, um, others are, are looking at this in a lot of different ways, right? But what you ought to know is that God's not punishing us, right? I mean, he says here in Romans chapter 8, notice this. This is Now, again, this is the, the to children of God, God's children. And you become a child of God by faith in Christ Jesus, Galatians chapter 3. The issue is, you know, you know, the Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We're talking about those children, saved by God's great grace, right? But anyways, those children, all right, uh, as children of God, we can, you know, listen to our parents, okay, God, right, or not, right? And it says here in Romans chapter 8, verse 14, it says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. There's a special relationship. Now, we're all sons of God. Galatians talks about us. Uh, we've all received the adoption. That is, we have, all, we have been son-placed, and we are all adult children, in Christ, right? Uh, those who have trusted Christ, right? So I'm going to speak to believers here, all right? But, but there are those, but, you know, well, anyways, and if you're led of the Spirit of God, you're acting like that, all right? You're going to act like a child of God, right? Um, if we're not led of the Spirit, we are, we maybe don't act like what we ought to act like, right? But anyways, verse 15 says this, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage, again, the fear, Notice this, but ye have received a spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. You know, we have a special relationship with our God. That is, as children, we are children that are favorite sons, okay? We are all God's special children. I don't, you know, I don't know, I, I, I came from a family of two, and my parents were, uh, um, all, you know, they were the epitome of fairness, all right? Um, my dad wasn't treated as fairly when he grew up. Right, uh, and uh, w with his, his situation, his family, it was a it was a much different relationship that he had with his parents. Okay, uh, but in my family, the what I grew up in, it was fair. Okay, to the point where we would receive an envelope at Christmas with like twenty seven cents in it, because that was the difference in the price of gifts or something like that. Uh, my parents wanted to know that we were equally loved. Well, God's children are equally loved. We're all His special. We're the apple of His eye. Right, God loves us. In fact, it says here that our relationship, the spirit, we've received the spirit of adoption, as we've been placed in a position where we can cry, "Abba, Father." That is to God the Father, dear Daddy. Is that the, that's the idea? It's a it's a close, personal relationship. Our God is a personal God, one who 
knows you and wants you to know him in a very real way. All right, to the point where you can go in and sit at his feet to, to, to come before him at any time. Okay, this little child, you know, like if you went back into the days of kings and feudal kings and things like that, okay, um, you know, to just run into the king's presence, you risked your life. But that little three-year-old or four-year-old that was the love of his dad could go in to the throne room at any time and sit upon his father's knee. God, our relationship with Christ and God the Father is that. We can go to him at any time. We have a dear daddy relationship. But notice, we haven't received the spirit of bondage again to fear. We're not in the situation like under the law, okay, where that's that, bond, that issue of bondage, where the issue is if you are out of line, if you're not doing what you ought to do, man, you got smacked, all right? That's what happened to, uh, to the nation of Israel or, or to those in the Old Testament, okay, the, that... They were under the spirit of a a bondage, all right? Read Deuteronomy Deuteronomy 28 one time and see the blessings and the cursings. That's that spirit of a bondage. We're not under that. It says in Colossians that the law was nailed to the cross, and he's forgiven us all trespasses and sins. We have a very special, special relationship. So God doesn't doesn't have us under fear today. It's not whatever's happening in the world right now is not from God, right? It's not... Something that God's bringing down on mankind in this age, uh, as Paul talks about it, this is the dispensation of the grace of God. God is, God is right now at this point in time, called a true or called well declared peace, so that individuals can cross over and come and be rescued from this present evil world, you know. And we, as members of the body of Christ, are ambassadors for Christ, and we are to share the gospel, uh, the good news that Christ died for every man. Okay, and woman and child, boy and girl, he's died for all, right? And that he paid for the sins of all so that anyone at any place at any time could call on the name of the Lord and be saved. Believing that Jesus Christ is God himself and he had died and he died and was buried and rose again for them and they can have eternal life. Praise God, right? It's a beautiful message that we have to share with anyone, right? No matter what's happening. In fact, thinking about what's going on in the world, isn't that the message that everyone needs? We need to be telling others about this. We need to be sharing the love that our Father has shared with us and that we can call him dear, dear Daddy. Right? So why do we have fear? If God's not given us a spirit of fear and God doesn't want us to fear, all right, that he doesn't, you know, he wants us to have this, you know, very close, you know, feeling of love, all right, because that's the love he has for us. All right, so then why do we have this fear? Well, we got a problem, right? Even as children of God, we have a situation in our life where there is a part of us that needs to be filled. Okay, there is a throne in our life, all right? A, a throne that 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 either that that's that that part of us needs to sit on it. There's a there as, as the scripture talks about. We talk about our flesh and our and our and this is Christ in our life, or our old man, or in the new man, right? There's this there's this new situation in a believer's life that happens at the moment of salvation. Christ comes into your life, right? The Holy Spirit indwells you. He makes it His throne. You are now the holy place uh, of God. God has placed His presence in you. Turn your Bibles to Ephesians four. And we've just got a couple of passages to talk about this. But there is there's a problem. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a problem that only believers face. That is, that there's a struggle going on in each and every one of us, right? And it's who is going to sit on the throne in our life, right? It says in Ephesians 4, verse 17, it says this, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity, the emptiness of their mind. You know, by the way, when we have fear, our mind goes empty, okay? So we don't want to be like that, right? Right? Uh, the lost, those like the Gentiles, they have their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Uh, they don't, don't know Christ. They're, they're blind, right? Okay? And it talks to us 
uh, in verse 22, it says this, that ye, talking about believers, that ye put off concerning the former conversation, that manner of life, that lifestyle, of the old man, okay, that former conversation of the, uh, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. You know, that old man, okay, by the way, that's who we all were before we knew Christ, okay, um, if you hold your place right there, we'll just go over to Ephesians 2. We're right there in that passage. So I'm going to read verse 1 and 2 and 3 uh, and 4. It says, And you had the quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation. We all men our life, how we live, in times past, in the lust of our flesh, um, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, whether he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ by grace. You are saved. You know, we all were in that situation. We all were in the situation of, of, uh, that we lived according to the course of this world. We all lived that way because that's the only way we could live until God. But God, who is rich in mercy, his grace and his love, for his great love, where he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quit us together with Christ by grace you are saved. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 says, But God commended his love towards us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You know, even when we were dead in sins, he took care of our sins. And we are no longer that old man. The book of Romans, which we'll go look at a couple of verses in in a bit, we won't have time to look at it in great detail. But it talks about the issues that you are not your old man. Okay, You are the new man in Christ. That's what Ephesians 4 is going to say here in just a sec. So let's take a look at that. Back to Ephesians 4, verse 22 telling this is what believers ought to be doing that we need to put we need to we need to put off push it away take it off now take it off the seat of authority of your life that you put off concerning the former conversation the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust that old man lies to you every moment that it can it lies to you about what's important in life it lies to you about what what you know what is the best thing to do? It lies to you about what love is. It lies to you what, how to think about life. You know, if you stay in the old man, you will be in fear. Because that's where the fear is coming from. Because God didn't give it to you. Because God gave you this, verse 23. He said, say, put that off, put off that old man, that old, that, that old, that old way of thinking. Because it's corrupt, it's deceitful, it lies. It has wants that, you know, sort of like, you know, that, that you think you want, but you don't need, right? In fact, if you get what you want, it will be bad, right? Verse 23 says, And be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God, which follows after God, is created in righteousness, and notice this, and true holiness. That new man is created in righteousness and true holiness. It's the righteousness of God in you, okay, you know, uh, God has, you know, he's taken his life, okay, he died for you, he gave you his righteousness, all right, to make you as righteous as him, and that new man is as righteous as him. The problem is, is that old man and that new man, they are still there, well, the old man is still there, that's the problem, the new man's great, okay. Now, when we go, when we go, go on to heaven, that old man gets left behind, all right, because we are the new man. And that's what Paul talks about in Romans chapter 7 and chapter 8, right? Let's look at Romans chapter 6, though. Let's turn there for a second. And I'm going to pick up a couple of verses about this old man, this old flesh, so that we understand uh, some aspects about, about this and what happened to the cross. You know, next week, well, you know, tomorrow is uh, the week before uh, Resurrection Sunday. I mean, we call it Palm Sunday, right? So we're, we're ramping up in our thinking about the cross, what Christ accomplished at the cross, right? And next, you know, Sunday, you know, eight days from now is Resurrection Sunday, eight days from when I'm presenting this, so a week from when you see this, so next Sunday. Um, 
But that that old that that old man was also crucified with Christ. Right? Look what it says in Romans six verse six. Right? You know, when we trusted Christ our Savior, we became totally identified with what the Lord Jesus Christ accomplished. He were identified with his death and his burial and his resurrection. Romans chapter 6 at the end there says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, sin has, you know, is earning something on a regular basis. It's earning wages. And that wages is death. And that death happens to be not just physical death. It's death in the lake of fire. It's that eternal death, that second death that's spoken about in the book of Revelation. Those wages need to be paid. Christ died our death, right? And when we trusted Christ our Savior, God the Holy Spirit placed us, identified us into the body of Christ, into Christ, and identified us with his death. So his death became our death, right? His burial became our burial, and his resurrection became our resurrection. We're going to be raised in news of life because Christ was raised. Christ died, we died. Paul says in Galatians 2, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. You know, I, was, I, was die, I died with Christ, but I'm alive. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I'm in a new position. I'm in a new state. I'm in a new situation because I die with Christ. And he's referring to what's going on here in Romans chapter 6. Verse 6 says this, Knowing this, that our old man, that old flesh, is crucified with him, Jesus Christ, that the body of sin, that old, this old flesh, might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Now that word destroyed means not eliminated. It doesn't mean, you know, annihilated. What it means is it, been, it was taken down. It was taken, you know, it was, it was taken off its seat of authority in your life because it says that henceforth we should not serve sin. So it used to be before we had Christ in our life, that's all we could do was serve sin because that was our nature. We were following our daddy, okay? It says in Ephesians chapter 2. But now, because of the cross, that old man was crucified with Christ so that we don't need to, have to, serve sin anymore. Why? Verse 7 says this, For he that is dead is freed from sin. You know, the one thing that doesn't happen in the grave is sin. You know, it doesn't happen. And, and by the way, for the ch children of God, when we die, we'll be absent from the body and present with the Lord. And we're not going to sin. You know, we're going to be with him. It's all gone, right? Down in verse 11, to talking about, you know, that Christ died for sin once, by the way, in verse 10, Okay, and he lives under God. Well, likewise, reckon ye also, verse 11, yourselves also, likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. Make it a reality. Reckon it so. Okay, make it a reality in your life that you are dead, that you are unresponsive, that you are separated from sin, that old sin nature. Live that way. It says there, try, try to, but, you know, likewise, you reckon yourself. Ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. You know what that's saying? You have a choice. Before you knew Christ, you didn't have a choice. But now you have a choice. You know what? And you can make a bad choice. God says, don't let sin therefore reign in your mortal, this physical body. Don't let that old nature Get back on the throne. Christ took it, destroyed it, took away its power, and put a new life in you that is created in righteousness and true holiness. Let it reign. Don't let your old flesh reign. You know, the problem is many of us have lived longer in the flesh than we've lived in our righteous in our in our, in our new man, right? Or, or or maybe we're more experienced at with our flesh. Our flesh, you know, it's strong, but it doesn't have to be. We need to learn to live in a new man. And that takes, you know, actually the Word of God, by the way, and takes faith and takes the Holy Spirit at work in our life. It's about depending and trusting in the Lord. And we will talk about that, right, 
Today I want to talk about why, right? Well, the problem is we have this old flesh, right? That old flesh, it says in verse 13, it's, it's, you know, God says this to each of us, neither yield to your members, that's your body, as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God. It's about yielding to Him. It says over in Romans uh, 8 or 6, 8, sorry, 8, you know, that, you know, to be led of the Spirit, right? You know, walk after the Spirit, right? That's how you have the victory over this. You got to follow God, follow close to God, okay? Be led of Him. Don't get in front of God. Lead, be led by God, right? Okay. And anyways, it says there, you know, it says don't, you know, don't, don't yield your, you know, yourselves as members and instruments of unrighteousness and sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead. You know what? You have been raised from the dead. You're no longer. You've been quickened, made alive in Jesus Christ, right? And your member members should now be instruments. Your body should now be an instrument of righteousness unto God. Praise God, right? That's an amazing truth and some amazing opportunity for each person. But the problem, again, as I said, is that old nature didn't go away, right? Look what it says over in Galatians 5. So why do we, you know, why do we fear? Well, because, you know what, we still have this old sin nature. And that sin nature is corrupt and deceitful. And it wants to take over your thinking and over your mind and over how you see things in the world. We need to see things the way God sees things. You know, again, if you then be, then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, right? Or Christ sitteth on the right hand of God, set your affection on things above. We're going to end with a passage in Philippians to talk about how to think, you know. Uh, here in Galatians 5, this is what the problem is, right? And Romans 6 goes through this. The Apostle Paul talks about, a, or actually Romans 7, talks about this struggle within himself, right? And and it talks about, you know, I'll find within myself a law, you know, with with... With my mind, I'm going to serve Christ, but then with my flesh, I serve sin. I mean, it's just, there's a conflict. That's what Galatians 5 is saying. This I say then, verse 16, this I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Simple statement. Walk in the Spirit, and you will not, you cannot, it's impossible to fulfill the lust of the flesh. Why? Well, verse 17 says this, For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. The spirit, this new life in your life that God has placed there, and that old flesh, they are contrary one to another. There is a battle going on. Every moment of every day, there is a conflict and a battle. Okay? It is something that the believers deal with. And you felt the convicting power of the Holy Spirit, perhaps, in your life, right? When you're not doing what you ought to do, you know it, right? You know, that's the Holy Spirit working in your life. Conflict is what's going on. Um, let's go to Romans chapter 8. Go back there for a second. And then we'll, we will start closing things up here. As I've said in, in Romans chapter 7 and verse 24, Paul says, O so wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? The Apostle Paul said that. Yeah, who are we compared to him? He talked about this struggle in his life, right? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind I serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. There's, just, there's, a, there's this, this set of rules that... that bind me and take me in different directions. He says in Romans 7 about the things I want to do, I can't do, and the things I don't want to do, I do. It sounds like every believer I know. You know, we always put in good intentions and we just can't seem to get them done. And then we find ourselves doing things we just can't believe we did. It's part of life, but it doesn't have to be because we don't have to serve sin anymore. You know, down in verse 11, it says this of Romans 8. Right, But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, so he's talking to, well, if, if that's true, and that's t so he's talking to believers, all right? So if and it's so, all right, that the spirit, you know, that the God, the Holy Spirit dwells in you, okay? He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken, make alive your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. The great thing for every child of God is that God, the Holy Spirit, is actively engaged in working in your life 
to help you walk in this new man. Right? The spirit that raised up Christ from the dead shall also make alive your mortal bodies. Not, you know, they're not talking about this is not about a resurrection. Okay, it's not about the rapture. It's about it in your daily walk in your life, right? God, the Holy Spirit, it, that dwells in you, is quickening you, making you alive, helping you to live the way we ought to do, right? Verse 12 says, Therefore, brethren, because God's at work in you, Holy Spirit's at work in you, you know, Christ, who is alive from the dead, is going to raise you, give you life in this life, right? Verse 12, therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. So we don't fall, you know, we're not a debtor to the flesh. We don't owe that old man anything, right? That old man is taking from you. Don't follow that flesh because it says this, for if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. Now that death is not physical death. This death, you know, death, by the way, in scripture generally means separation, right? If we live after the flesh, we're going to feel separate. We're going to be separated. We're going to be separated from the good things of God. The, you know, we're not going to feel the love of God. He loves us all the time. You're going to be separated from the peace of God. God's not caught doing war with you. He loves you. Yet we won't feel the peace. We'll have turmoil. We'll have, you know, worries and fears, right? We'll die. We'll, 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 we'll be separated from the joy and the goodness and the gentleness and the temperance and the love and the peace and all the things, you know, the fruit of the Spirit that God is. We will be separated from those things. We won't feel them. We won't experience them. Even though a child of God will be lost in our fear. And that fear, that's unhealthy fear, right, will grip us. But if ye shall, through the Spirit, but if ye, first, continuing verse 13, but, but if ye through the Spirit do mortify, put to death the deeds of the body, ye shall live. You know what? If you push down, if you do not allow that old flesh on the seat of your life, the seat of authority of your life, let it not reign in your mortal body, right? You shall live. You will. What I mean that? You'll be alive. You'll be alive in Christ. You will experience the joy. You'll experience the peace. You'll experience the the love and the goodness and the faith and the temperance and the gentleness and and the patience and all the good things of God. You'll be alive in those things. But we need to be working through the Spirit. We need to let the Spirit lead our life. That's the answer. Right? What's the problem? Why the fear? Well, it's our flesh. Right. God wants us, doesn't want us to have that fear. He wants us to be alive in Christ, right? To be alive in Christ, we need to allow the Holy Spirit to lead in our life. He's in you. God's put him there. And, and the Holy Spirit who dwells in you, that's what he's doing. That's what he's after you. But you got to let him. you got to make a choice on who's leading your life, right? It takes faith, right? And we're going to get there, okay? Not today, unfortunately, okay? But we need to allow God, the Holy Spirit, to work in, in our life. I'm going, to, I'm going to spend uh, probably five more minutes with you. Uh, I'm going to read two passages. Uh, we're, we're, in Romans, we're in Romans here, so just go back to Romans 5, verse 1. Uh, if Marcia is listening, uh, she would be saying right now, five minutes, you know, John, it's time, but uh, I'm good with that right now. But in Romans chapter 5, or my wife is snapping her fingers or something, it's time to go, but uh, I'm going to take a couple more minutes. Romans 5, verse 1, notice this. Therefore, being justified by faith, you know, when you trusted Christ, you became God justified. You declared you righteousness, righteous. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. God's not angry with us. We have peace. We have, we're standing in those things. But notice this. By whom? Jesus Christ. Also, we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. You know, we have... The answer to these things is faith. We access the things of God, all right, by faith, right? And we are standing in His grace. That's the things you got to note. Even in this day that we're in right now, you are standing in grace. You're not standing in the world where alone, away from God. You are standing in grace. That's the favor of God. 
you're standing in, you're, you know, you're, you have access to God. Think about those that don't know Christ. What access do they have? We have Christ, and we have access to God. And one last thing, let's talk about that access. Let's go over to Philippians chapter 4, at least one part of that access. Okay. So in Philippians chapter 4, because I want us to think, all right, so in this period of time, you know, that, you know, the issue is we don't, you know, we don't want to, God's not giving us a spirit of fear, but a power and a love and a sound mind, right? Um, we'll have those things by letting the Holy Spirit lead our life, right? Get, you know, let our new man lead, let, you know, put him on the seat of authority of our life, right? And not uh, follow the, the deeds of the flesh or uh, that old, that old, uh, that old flesh, right? In Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, it says this. This is what God says to us. It says here in Philippians 4, 4, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. You know, the Lord's coming soon for his children. I don't know how long soon is. It's God's timing, not mine, right? But, but notice this in verse 6. He said, Be careful for nothing. Do not be full of care for anything, right? Don't hold back. You have access to God. You stand in his grace. So go. Go in faith to the Lord, right? It says, But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made out unto God. You know, give it to God. Give it to him. When you give it to God, God takes it, and he makes it his. And we can depend upon him because he is faithful, right? And notice this. The fear goes away. Because we put God where he's supposed to be in our life. By the way, we do this in our new man, right? We, we go to God. We see him for who he is because God can do anything. Doesn't mean that you're, you know, you're supposed to, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll spend some time looking at prayer sometime. But the issue is God answers prayer. He answers every prayer, by the way. Okay? He doesn't always say yes. He sometimes says no. Sometimes he does something different. Sometimes he says wait, right? Sometimes we have no idea until we get to the other side of glory. Right, but anyways, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Why do we thankful? Because God's heard it, God's answering, and it's perfect. Right. Let your requests made known to God. Notice this, and the peace of God. You know what takes away fear? Peace. Right. The peace of God, which passes all understanding. Notice this. It shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The word keep there is the word garrison, to guard, to protect, to, to, to surround your heart. The worries, right, and the fears. He's going to surround that, protect it, and guard it. And then he guards our minds, our thoughts, our thinking, right? God's not going to spirit of fear, but he's given us power and love and a sound mind. And when we go to God, we need to give it to God. Okay, let him lead, right? And we need to, you know, think about other things. You know, I, I've I've learned in the last couple of weeks not to watch television all the time, to avoid watching the news all the time, to not be looking at the website analysis of all the things that are going on right now all the time, because it'll grip your thinking, right? You need to you need to step away from that, right, and look at things differently. It says verse eight says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true. What sort of things are honest? What sort of things are just? What sort of things are pure? What sort of things are lovely? What sort of things are of good report? If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. You think on those things, and it says there's those things which you've both learned, you know, from the Word of God, from others that have taught you some things, the things you've received, you know, that, that you've understood and heard, and Paul says here, and seen in me, do it. You know what? And the God of peace shall be with you. You know what? You'll have the, you, know, you will know that the Lord is standing right there with you, right? How could you be afraid if God is standing right there with you, right? And you would know it. But we need, to, we need to do the things that God's called us to do. We need to be led of the Spirit. We need to think the way we ought to think, right? You know, and then God will, we need to walk by faith. Paul says, I've had a lot of problems in my life. He says in verse 12, I know both how to be abased Right, well, verse 11 says, Not that I speak in respect of want, verse 11, for I have learned that whatsoever stead I am, therewith to be content. You know, basically understand that God's there with me. I'm okay. okay. I may want more. I may want other things. 
but I'm content at this moment in time because God is with me, right? I know how, to, I said, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound, okay? Everywhere and all things I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and suffer need. You know, I've, I've experienced the, you know, the, 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 uh, the scale of everything. I've had nothing to everything, right, uh, in all things. But he said, I've learned something. I can do all things, here's the power, through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Praise God. You know, God will strengthen us. God is watching over us. God's caring for us. You need to, we need to make sure we pay attention to that, that no matter what we hear, what we see, what's going on around us, that God is our God. Our God loves us. Our God is for us. Romans chapter uh, eight. Uh, God, you know, we, you know. There, there's nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. You know, there's nothing that's there that's that's against us. You know, all things work together for good to them that are uh, that are uh, called according to His purpose. You know, to them that love God, and called according to His purpose. That's who we are in Christ. Remember that, right? There is. Lots of things to be fearful about, but they don't need to grip you, right? It doesn't have to be unhealthy, okay? God's, the things that are going on in this world are scary, right? But what you need to understand is that regardless of what happens, our God loves you, he loves me, he's for us, and regardless of what happens in this life, we have an eternity with him that is guaranteed and promised. Praise God for that. I do pray for you, and I can hopefully you'll pray for me and pray for the or the, or the, uh, the individuals that you know in your surroundings and that are that are around you, you're near you, and your neighbors. I've met more neighbors in the neighborhood walking around this week because everybody's sort of just doing you know less stuff because we're all around. So take these opportunities to be a powerful witness for Jesus Christ. Right? Let let your strength and your assurance come forward so others see because God will use that to reach others for Jesus Christ. You know, Pastor Colt, you know, our, our founding pastor, always ended his message with keep looking up. You know what? I, I think we should start saying that more often ourselves. We need to keep looking up. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your message. We thank you for your word. We pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit might touch each person as they hear this. Let them hear what you want them to hear. Touch their hearts with what you want them to know. And Lord, lead them, Lord, on, the, on the, the good things. We praise you, Lord, for what you will continue to do and always will do in every situation. And in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen, brothers and sisters.